I'm Sierra Jepson. I am the owner, lead butcher, and the meat scientist for Butcher Solutions, LLC. That is my business. I train butchers for a living, which is really fun. Um, I actually have a master's degree in meat science. That is a real thing. So meat science education is something I really love. And the hunting community are people that you're, you're one day a year, you all are butchers. Whether you want to or not, you are and you need to be. Um, because as much fun as it is to go out, you know, stalk those critters, be out in the woods, you then have meat to work up. Um, and so there is more that we can do other than just hind quarter steaks, four quarter roasts. Um, up here I've got a, a carcass, you know, that is meant to simulate a beef carcass. But there are a lot of different cuts and magnets and things that we can break off here, meaning that there are a lot of cuts that come off a beef carcass. And why shouldn't we be doing those exact same things with the game that we're bringing in? Why can't we have a brisket, a Delmonico, a Denver cut? Why can't we do that? Um, and so tonight we are going to learn how to do those things. Before we get like started with this like beautiful cut of meat that we have up here, a couple of the things I do want to mention would be what tools do you need at home to be successful with cutting up your own products and where can you buy them and you know what's a, a niceness or a, I guess a, a delightful surprise but maybe not a necessity. So you are going to need a good knife. And I mean, that's the key for any butcher, like starting with a good knife is absolutely essential. So there are two that I would highly recommend for you all to have. Um, the first one being a boning knife. It can be any kind of boning knife that you all want to have, but it, you just, you need a boning knife. Um, you can do everything with a boning knife um, from taking the hide off of the animal, breaking apart joints, skinning, and then actually making your cuts, okay? So a boning knife, I would highly recommend um, purchasing one. You can be a meat scientist or you can be a butcher with just a boning knife. Um, the other knife that I would recommend that you have would be some kind of a breaking knife or a staking knife, okay? This is gonna help you make really, really nice cuts out of ribeyes, out of um, London broils, out of your hindquarter steaks. Um, bigger the knife, the smoother the cut. So those two knives will get you far, far and away. And those are pretty much the only two knives that I'm gonna use this evening. Yes, I have several others in the arsenal. They're just various different lengths and sharpness, just so I don't embarrass myself in front of you all. You also might recognize some cutting boards up here. Cutting boards and having cl a clean, nice surface for yourself to work on is really, really important. Um, I went to a kitchen warehouse store online and just purchased some of their replacement tabletops. That's what these are, is for a commercial kitchen, um, what they would put on top of a kitchen table or on, on top of one of their prep tables. So if you go to Walmart, if you order something off Amazon, they aren't going to have these nice big cutting boards. That's okay. Um, so you can order them online on you know, some kind of a kitchen warehouse. But just having a cutting board that is designated to meat is very important, um, not wood. Um, wooden cutting boards like to harbor a lot of pathogens in them. They're also really difficult to clean. And so having something that's a poly top um, is very, very important. A good thing to have at home would be some form of knife sharpening tool. Um, I personally like to work with a stone. Um, working with either a, this is a water stone, you can also use an oil stone. Um, working with stones really helps you understand which angle you're hitting on your knife um, and you make sure that you have the exact same angle every single time. The angle that you are sharpening your knife is really the key to getting a sharp knife. And so whatever you all feel comfortable using at home, that might be purchasing something off Amazon that's just a little handheld like knife sharpener that you, you know, run through the blade, that's perfectly fine. The best way to keep your knife sharp would be a honing steel. Honing steels do not sharpen your knives, okay? Everybody's probably got one of these in their knife block at home, okay? This hones. It's a honing steel, so it hones the edge. So if we can imagine that our, our knife um, has teeth that sit like this, um, eventually those, those teeth, as we you know, knock it against the table, as we hit a bone, as we stab our husband with it, those teeth will round out, and that's called a rolled edge, okay? And so when we roll our edge, you can you know, run your finger across that blade or it bounces off your husband, whatever it might be. Um, that's how we know that you actually have a dull knife. So that's time to sharpen it. When you sharpen it, those edges will then come up and look something like this. Great, we think it's sharp. Not quite. The honing steel 
these little things that we never use in our knife blocks at home. This is then what takes our, our teeth on those knives from this to this. Okay, and so as I'm cutting this evening, you're going to see me stealing my knife quite a bit. We had a gentleman from over in Big Timber donate this elk to us um, for the purpose of this cutting demo. So I wanted this to be as realistic as possible, as if you all were at home. Thank you so much. You all were at home. You had, you know, either yourself had just killed an elk or a mule deer or a moose or whatever it might. You can do these cuts with a bear if you really want to. Um, Pretty much all of us have the exact same muscles as what these critters have. It's just whether we know how to cut them or not. Um, so I wanted this to be as realistic as possible. So the only thing I've done to this meat is I've cleaned up some of the dirt. So the only thing that's a little bit dirty still are these shanks. And so that's something that you all are gonna have to look out for too when you have this meat you know, fresh out of a bag is that we're not contaminating our cut surface. So as we're thinking about our surface at home, I would always recommend that you kind of have two cutting boards. Today I got a little greedy and I have three. But as long as you have what you would consider like a dirty surface and then a clean surface, that's something that's really important. Because we want to protect ourselves from E. coli 0157H7, which is a dangerous pathogen that could make us sick. E. coli 0157H7 is found on fecal, it's found on milk and it's found on ingesta. And so those three things come off of carcasses and those three things could make us really, really ill. So that's why it's important to clean your meat of any debris before you actually get cutting. Now, notice, I didn't mention dirt, I didn't mention hair, I didn't mention rocks, any of that good stuff, but hair, dirt, rocks, that stuff could have fecal milk ingesta on it. So clean your meat before you get going. That's just the best thing you can do for yourself. Put the dirtiest side up, make sure it's like super clean, get in here, check it out, and then flip the whole thing over onto your clean table and then keep this one your dirty. And then you know, work this one up, make it nice and clean. And if you have another cutting board or something, then you can be putting your cuts over there. So keep your space as clean as possible. Keep yourself safe from fecal milk ingesta, E. coli 0157H7. So, out of the clod here, we're able to get several innovative cuts. This is where the flat iron comes from. This is where the terrace major, the shoulder tender come from, um, comes from. And we're also gonna do a cut called ranch steaks. Alrighty, here we go, I'm so excited. So when you guys are cutting these clods, I want you to flip it over so that this, this is the inside that was you know, tucked right up against that animal. We peeled through this seam. Um, this big fat pad really made that nice and easy for us to, to seam through. I want you to find these muscles right through here, okay? These are gonna be um, actually really, really tasty steaks, and a lot of times we don't, we don't know it. So we're going to um, start off, I'm just gonna trim this guy away. This is just trim, nothing super important. To, 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 to put that in my trim bucket. Alrighty, and so now we can see there's this muscle right here. This muscle sits under the scapula. It's called the subscapularis, it sits under the scapula. That's gonna be the first muscle I take off. Dun, 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 dun. So this muscle, this subscapularis muscle, is really, really tender. They put a patent on this muscle, which is why you don't see it in big steakhouses, you don't really hear about it other places, is because every single time somebody sells this subscapularis as the Vegas strip steak, which is what it's called, we need to pay some kind of a premium. So that's why you don't know about this steak, but it's called the Vegas strip steak, and it truly comes off of that, right off the top of that blade bone. Okay, there we go. And so it's, it's fairly long, fairly flat, and there is some connective tissue on this side that will clean up. But that is the first cut that you want to salvage as an actual steak. And it'll be fairly thin. You're only gonna get uh, two for the whole carcass, one per side. Um, so you can package them together, but they're very thin um, and they're, they're very tender too. And so um, you can consider these kind of like a minute steak, just you know, flash them in the pan. Um, cast iron works great. Cast iron's how I cook everything at home. Um, I do get accused of smoking up my house quite often, but that's just fine, um, especially for steaks like these that are really, really quick and easy to cut. So the Vegas strip steak, 
right off the top of that scap or off the bottom of the scapula, subscapularis. Um, I will use a lot of scientific names this evening. You don't have to remember them. There's one that I will tell you you have to remember, and you do, um, but that is the only one. The other ones, they're just me talking to myself. Okay? Okay, so the vagus strip stake right off the, the bottom of that scapula. The one that sits right next to it then, over here, this is the teres major. I said you had to remember one, and here we are, the teres major. This is the only muscle in the entire carcass that is being merchandised by its scientific name. Okay? Can everybody see where this guy is sitting at? Um, it's kind of a torpedo shape. This one's really important. Okay? It is super tender. Back in the 2000s, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association did some meat science research. And they said, if we could take apart every single muscle that's in a beef chuck, or the beef shoulder, and rather than cutting just chuck roasts out of them, what if we took every muscle apart and we found which ones were tough and which ones were actually really tender? This is one of the tender cuts. Okay? It's called the Terrace Major because that's its scientific name, but its common name is the shoulder tender. And it's very easy con to confuse with the next cut that I'm going to show you. So this little torpedo-shaped muscle is going to just peel right out of here, and it sits right next to that Vegas strip steak. Okay? And we're just going to pop it out of there, and it's going to be long and tender. This is another cut. You're only going to get two out of the whole carcass, one per side, but it's worth it, I promise you. Um, the bigger the animal, the better. Um, so if you can cut these on a moose or an elk, um, that is preferred. You can probably find one on an antelope or a whitetail, but um, these muscles, as you can tell, it's not super big sitting here on the table, and so it's going to be kind of hard to find out of your smaller critters. So um, it's okay if you're like, I'm totally lost when it comes to those bigger animals, or to the smaller animals. Try to find it on the bigger ones. Um, this steak, you would be able just to grill this directly whole and then slice it up. Um, you can serve that as an appetizer. You could put it on a salad. Um, you could serve it, you know, I think in copper they uh, served it with fries. So either way, um, but this is the Terrace Major. It's called the Shoulder Tender as its common name. So right here on the other side of where um, our Vegas Strip steak sat right here, the Terrace Major sat on the other side. We're jumping over, okay? This is where you, um, I wish you all could feel this, but there's um, the spine of the scapula sits right here. You can kind of run your finger along it. So I'm going to take out the mock tender, okay? The mock tender is also called the chuck tender, which is why we don't call this one the chuck tender and that one the shoulder tender. They're just too close together. Um, so when I'm training butchers, I want everybody to know the scientific names because it gets really confusing for our customers when we call everything super duper similar names or we call them like random things like the Denver cut that gives us no indication of where it's actually from on the animal or the flat iron. You don't need to be super careful with this muscle because it's kind of trash. It is my second least favorite muscle in the entire carcass. I will show you my, my least favorite later on. Um, the chuck tender is really tough. Um, and I, it is called the mock tender for a reason. Um, oh, it's a little frozen. It's called the mock tender because it does kind of, sort of, in a way, resemble what a tenderloin would look like. So it's called the mock tender because if we were to cut fillets out of this muscle, or little, dun, 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 dun little fillet steaks, they would truly look like tenderloin steaks. And that's very, very deceiving because this muscle is not tender in the slightest. It's one of the most tough out of this entire section. Most of us want more steaks, less roast, right? This is not a muscle that you want to cut steaks out of. Um, if you do, which is fine, you are going to discover, you know, let's see, there is a piece of connective tissue right here. And so if I go through and I cut these really, really pretty medallions and they look like tenderloin steaks and they're beautiful, that's fine. But this piece of connective tissue is going to make that steak really, really tough. And so if I do choose, which is totally fine, to cut steaks out of the mock tender, 
what you need to do is go through and find that connective tissue and cut it off. And now you have a fairly you know, tender steak, actually, and that's just fine. The trouble is, is that then we are putting more meat into our grind pile. So it comes down to what your goal is. Do we want to have as much yield as possible? If so, I recommend keeping that mock tender as a roast. If your goal is to have as many grillable items as possible, go ahead and cut the mock tender into steaks. Keep you know, the larger portion as a mock tender steak and then grind the smaller portion. Okay. Da, 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 da. This is where we can whip out our steak knives here. And because this gentleman wants as many grillable items as possible, we'll just go through and we'll cut him some steaks here. I'm using a push-pull method here, meaning truly you push and then you pull back to finish that cut, which makes sure that you have a really nice cut. And so what you can see with some of these mock tender steaks, and we'll go through and we'll cut off those portion where that really tough connected tissue's at. So they are gonna come out to be what look like fillets, but they're not, they are mock tenders. And they should be kept as such. Okay. Again, on these bigger critters, it's very easy to cut steaks that are, that are really nice out of this, this mock tender. On a smaller animal, keep this whole muscle as a roast. Don't bother trying, because I mean, you might be able to see some of these other cuts um, as I you know, got further down through that muscle. It started just basically having to cut that muscle in half. And so if you're trying to do this on an antelope or a deer, this fillet portion is gonna get really, really small. So if you're working on a deer, keep the whole mock tender, the whole chuck tender um, together as one roast, put it in the crock pot, it'll be great. And these guys I will keep as chuck tender steaks. Again, my professional opinion as a meat scientist, keep that whole thing as a roast. And then down here, this is just part of the latissimus, the lats. Um, that's a really good muscle. If you'd like something to slice as jerky, you're more than welcome to keep this muscle and to slice it. You could definitely go. And as you're slicing jerky, just get a nice big flat piece of meat and then kind of angle your knife. I'm gonna use a different knife. Whoops, meat on the floor. Hey Finn, that's for you, buddy. <laughs> All right. And then we're just gonna make nice strips. And these can then be jerky later. Jerky, ground beef, and London broil are like the three things that you can make pretty much anything out of. So Jerky, you can take any muscle, slice it really thin. As long as you're slicing, I'm not sure if we can see here. So the grains of the meat are running in this direction. As we're trying to make our meat a little bit more tender, you want to cut across the grain, okay? Meaning if the grains are running this direction, switch the way that you're cutting it. And that will basically make it a little bit easier for you to chew through that piece of meat. Um, any lean piece of meat that you find, especially in, in the shoulder or in the hind quarter, you can make jerky out of it. Um, any of the trimmings that we have, that's all going to go into burger. London broil is another cut of meat that I mentioned because London broil is not a specific cut. London broil just refers to big lean piece of meat. And so you can make a London broil out of anything. And when you go to the grocery store and you see a London broil, it could also be anything. I'm going to make London broils out of the hind quarter this evening. Um, but yes, so jerky, London broil can be really anything. This animal is basically sitting here. There we go, like this, okay? It's laying here on the table, and this muscle right here is the bicep. This muscle right here is the tricep, okay? So as our animals are walking, let's see, I'm, I'm not an animal, but they're basically, they're using, <laughs> I mean, maybe I am, um, they're using their tricep much more than they use their bicep. So the tricep here is going to be a really, really large piece of meat, it's going to be fairly tough, but that's where we're going to get our ranch steaks out of. It can actually become a really, really tender cut of meat. Um, it is called the tricep because it has three heads on it. If we peel apart some of those heads, then we can find an actual really tender, awesome piece of meat. Okay, so the bicep is always going to be grind. Um, it's just got a lot of tendons in it, and so it sits right here. It's actually pretty small, and even in the beef industry, um, we, d we don't really do anything with this muscle. So the bicep will always be grind. 
<laughs> and I would encourage, I mean, certainly make your grind as lean as possible. I'm not going to bore you this evening with you know, spending all of the time here you know, cleaning this up. I will do that at home. But I would encourage a lot of, a lot of the meat grinders that you all can purchase um, you know, at Murdoch's or wherever it might be, they don't have a little offshoot that kicks out all of the gristle, that kicks out bone, that kicks out silver skin, whatever it might be. So whatever you're putting into your grind, it's going to be what you consume, which is just fine, but making your, your grind as lean as possible um, without as, you know, all the tendons and good stuff will just make your life easier when you go through that grind process. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna take off here is just going to be loosening up this triceps muscle. Okay, so just loosening it just a little bit here, loosening around this scapula, and then loosening up top here. Just finding that bone, tracing around it. All right, all right. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and flip this whole thing over, and we're pretty much done in this set. So as I flip over here, I see more pathways. So this muscle that sits right here is on the other side of the scapula. So I took off the subscapularis from underneath the scapula. This one then sits on top of the scapula. This one sits on the outside of the animal, and this is where our flat iron comes from. Okay, um, And so as you are skinning out your animals, you do have to be careful on this front shoulder that you don't accidentally gouge because this muscle truly sits just right on the outside of that critter. I mean, you can see it ripple as they walk. Okay, So we want to be careful of that guy. All right, I'm going to keep taking off the, the triceps here. All righty. Falling through. The triceps muscle, you might recognize it called an arm roast in the beef community, in the beef world. Okay? Arm roasts, they're really good, they're really lean. And so if you are a person that is interested in having more roasts or you have big families to feed, you can keep this entire muscle as a roast. Um, or you can cut it in half. You can do whatever you want with it. It's your meat, you killed it. Um, but there is a way to turn it into a really terrific steak. Um, actually, several terrific steaks because you can um, you can see it's a pretty big muscle, and so you can actually get quite a few steaks out of it. Okay, where are you? All right, so I'm just working around this ulna, which is the elbow. Okay, and then that guy sits there. So with this triceps, triceps meaning tri, there are three muscles. And basically, all I have to do is just start finding seams and just start taking muscles off. The biggest muscle, the last one standing, that's the muscle you want or the, the lateral head that you want. Um, so just start finding little muscles. It's like, oh, right here, that's a little muscle. Take it off. Okay. Great, gone. Okay, okay, I don't really see anymore. I flip it over. It's like, oh, look. Here looks like there's, there's a seam right here. Start trimming that one off. And you're just going to start finding seams and just make a big piece of meat smaller. And again, you could leave this entire triceps as a roast, call it an arm roast, and they're really delicious. Very, very lean, very, very good. But if you want more steaks, this is how you get it. And then... Voila, I have found the biggest, most victorious muscle out of that tricep, okay? It's the biggest one, it wins, right? Okay, this muscle then, it's still part of the triceps, it's just one of those lateral heads. I'm going to clean off this silver skin, and this is where I get ranch steaks out of. Um, back to that research that was done in the early 2000s, um, this was one of the steaks that the National Cattlemen's Beef Association found in beef carcasses and said, hey, if we peel apart all of these lateral heads off of that triceps, we're left with this one pretty big lean piece of meat that should actually be cut into steaks. There are very few butchers that actually take the time to cut steaks out of that triceps because an arm roast is still very, very popular in the beef world. But if we all are at home and we took the time to harvest this animal and we want more product that can go on the grill, this is a really great way to get it. Anybody likes breakfast steaks or, you know, 
need some protein in the morning. These ranch steaks are a really good way to get that. Okay. When should we age meat? If you are able to hang your, your carcass, um, that's the best way to age game. Um, especially if you can keep it dry. Um, I do not recommend, um, you know, a lot of people think it's like, okay, I'm going to go out, I'm going to um, skin this carcass all out, and then I'm going to hose it off um, and, you know, make it, make it really, really clean. When you hose off that carcass, anything that might be left that's a contaminant, that fecal, that milk ingesta, dirt, rocks, hair, whatever it might be, if you spray that carcass down with water, you're just spreading that contamination from the top to the bottom. So don't spray them down. And if you add any extra water to that carcass, water aids in bacteria growth. And so I don't recommend spraying them down. Keep them as dry as you can. Um, if you have a cool, dry place to hang a carcass um, and you're really interested in aging them for a long time, a little shortcut method that you can use um, to prevent microbial growth would be spraying white wine vinegar on them. And so that serves kind of like a lactic acid that they use in big beef packing plants. Spray white wine vinegar on it, and then that will also aid in that aging process and keep microbial growth off of the outside of it. Um, if you don't have a place to hang either the whole carcass or a subprimal, that's just fine. Um, you can wet age your game. Wet aging does not mean putting it in a Ziploc bag and putting it to the back of your fridge and letting it sit there for four weeks. That would be mold, not age. <laughs> um, so if you want to wet age something, you can do you know, pretty much these cuts that I'm doing now where you take off, um, you know, you take off big pieces of meat and then put them in a vacuum seal bag, vacuum seal them, and then you can put them in your fridge and let them wet age. Um, that is how the beef industry most prevalently ages our beef today because they kill it on day one, they let it hang on day two, and they cut it on day three, which means you all can do that too. Um, as it sits in that wet aging bag, it is you know, breaking down muscle tissue. It's doing all the, the good things that dry aging does. Um, a lot of us don't have that luxury and wet aging we don't do it a lot in game because if i've already taken the time to make this much of a mess i might as well just keep working it up and that's just fine um, a lot of us you know if we're not interested in aging with game we're probably not going to see you know as as big of a difference as we might see in like the beef industry and we don't want that meat to be filling up our fridge for two three weeks um, if you are interested in aging it two weeks is the only you know, length of time that you really need. You don't need 45 days um, because at the end of those two weeks, the microbes and um, I guess like all of the, the collagen has broken down in the meat naturally. Um, there's not any added um, tender, tenderization that you get after two weeks. Maybe, maybe minuscule, but you're not gonna see the big difference that you do in those two weeks. When it comes to, when it comes to thawing out meat, um, and I, I think butcher paper and vac wrap are two main ways that our butchers are sending you home with meat or that you all might be um, having meat at home as well. Um, butcher paper, just fine. You know, let that sit in your fridge for 24 hours. It thaws out really quickly. If you're in a pinch, um, you can always put it in the microwave. Vac pack works really great. The way I like to thaw out meat is putting it in water. So vac pack, you know, vacuum package bags, you can put that whole thing, submerge it in water, and your steaks will be thawed in 10 minutes. So you don't need to sit, like let those steaks sit for a really long time. You don't need to microwave them or anything. Um, likewise, if you have all of your steaks packaged in butcher paper, you can use the water method. Put that whole butcher papered bag in a Ziploc and then put that in a bowl of water. Um, you can you know, let that sit throughout the day if it's a big roast. Um, if you're in a pinch, your, your steaks will be thawed in a matter of minutes in water, which is incredible. Okay, so I'm going to finish up my, my little triceps here, which is our ranch steaks. Da, 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 that's not what I want. All right, and basically, again, I'm going to find the direction that those grains are going, and then I'm just going to flip it the opposite direction and cut ranch steaks. And I'll cut these, I don't know, an inch thick because then we can use these as breakfast steaks. There we go. <laughs> we can get one more, make our packages even. Terrific. 
And those are our ranch cut steaks. All right? They're really, really tender. They're really great. And they come out of the shoulder, which is amazing. All right, those are ranch steaks. Beautiful. All right. And then there's one last cut I know we've all been waiting to learn about, which is the flat iron. So the flat iron then comes off of the rest of our shoulder blade here. So I'm going to go ahead. Pop through this guy. And just separate off that scapula from the rest of the humerus. OK. Beautiful. Everything else off of there. Perfect. So flat iron. Again, so here's that spine of the scapula here. If you could feel it, you could. Um, all I'm going to do is just bury my knife right next to that spine of the scapula and just drag it straight down. I'm just going to make one cut here. And then I'm going to use my hook because I have it and I can. Um, but you, what you all can do, you also, a little frozen up top here, um, you can take your knife and you can you know, peel this whole muscle. What we're going to do is peel it off of this scapula here. Um, but I have a hook. And so what I'm going to do is get right up against that spine. Man, it's frozen. Dry ice. What a beauty. And I'm going to scrape it off this bone. Because this flat iron, man, is slippery. It has connective tissue that sits on top that protects it from the outside of the animal. But then it also has connective tissue that sits on the bottom that prevents it from having a lot of friction rubbing up against this bone. And so by scraping it, I'm just loosening that connective tissue, getting a really clean cut off of it. There we go. Whew. So with dry ice, I guess I'll mention this. I recommend if you know that you are going to pick up an animal, um, if your buddy calls and says, hey, I got one down, can you meet me with the coolers? Stop, pick up your ice, pick up your um, whatever cooling agent you're going to use, whether it's ice, whether it's dry ice, um, and start getting those coolers cold. Especially if you're planning on leaving that carcass sit there overnight for a couple of days, um, the best thing that you can do is have that cooler cold first. And if you do that, it gives you the opportunity to use your cooler racks. These little things that you know, maybe we just throw away. Put the dry ice at the bottom of your cooler and then set this over top of it. Okay? Your meat will then sit over top, but then your meat isn't in direct contact with your dry ice. You then have cold airflow, more or less, underneath of your meat. Pile it on top, and then you can put more ice on top of it. But whatever you put in the cooler first, if you don't put something you know, cold underneath it, that's probably going to collect a lot of heat down there, and we get what we call sour bone. So you can use your little cooler racks there, put dry ice underneath it or just regular ice, and then use that as a cooling agent. But you have to think about that before you go and start throwing meat in the cooler, or else then you have to take meat out of the cooler. Okay. What are we doing here? Okay. So peeling off this muscle. This whole thing I'm taking off right now, it's not a flat iron yet. Right now, it is the top blade. Top blade because the, the Vegas strip steak sat underneath the scapula. This one sits on top of the scapula, so it is the top blade. Okay, so this top blade. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Goodbye, scapula. This top blade becomes a flat iron, but it's not yet because there is a really, really tough piece of connective tissue that sits in here. Okay? There is a piece of connective tissue that runs along the, the neck of our animals. We call that the back strap, which I know a lot of people call the, the ribeye um, in, the, in the game world. But it's called the back strap or the paddy whack. It's that really, really yellow um, piece of connective tissue you might find. That whole piece that sits there and runs across the back of the neck that lifts that animal's head, that has these big antlers, this piece of connective tissue is more tough than that. Wild. Nuts. 
This muscle is the second most tender muscle in the entire carcass. Meat scientists, we don't like to rank muscles very much because depending on how we cook them or how we cut them, you know, that could change. And we as humans, we love to rank things. We just want to know what's the best. This muscle, though, scientifically, time and time again, is the second most tender muscle in the entire carcass, next only to the tenderloin. Sorry, front row, I'm thinking meat. So this really tender muscle is combined with this really tough tendon. So you are not doing yourself any favors if you say, great, I found the top blade. I'm going to cut flat irons. And you go through and you cut steaks. Da -da -da -da. Good. That look like this because as I go through and I cut more like that, this really, really thick piece of connective tissue, I don't know if you can see it, that thick piece of connective tissue then starts to travel across the entire steak. And then you're going to have a steak that's tender on this side, tender on that side, but really tough everywhere else. And you're not going to be able to eat it like a normal steak. So this whole thing right now is a top blade roast. You can do a top blade roast in really any animal you want. Again, some of those smaller critters, um, if you don't feel like really confident in your filleting abilities, you can leave it as a top blade roast. You could probably even smoke it. Um, this piece of connective tissue will still be there and still fully intact by the time you're done smoking it. So you might just have to fillet it from there. But this is where then we get our flat irons from, is that we have to go through and fillet the top and the bottom of this muscle. and separate these two really tender portions from that really, really tough piece of collagen. Nice. Favorite brand. So this little blue guy is an F dick. I like it a lot. Um, Victorinox, the steel holds up really well. When you're looking for a boning knife, I like a semi-stiff blade um, just because it, it will bend a little bit. Um, but it's, there are some that are, if they're a flexible blade, um, for things like this where I'm trying to get under silver skin, they're just going to be wiggling and wobbling all over the place. So something that's semi-stiff, I would definitely recommend um, because then you can use that multi-purpose to actually bone out products too and your knife isn't going to bend too much on you. I can see here, here's where that really tough tendon's at. If I want to cheat a little bit, which we always do, what you can do is take a really thin slice off of the side here. And that's going to expose where that tendon sits the entire way down. I don't know if we can see this. But it's going to expose where that piece of connective tissue is at. And so then I can really easily follow that with my knife. All right. So what I'm going to do is I just put my knife right on top of that piece of connective tissue. I'm just going to follow it down push against that connective tissue, keeping on the bottom. Again, it's really, really tough. And so if I keep that against the bottom of my knife and flip it over, okay? So there's still a little bit here, a little bit up top here that's lean. Take a little shaving off. Then that, that exposes where the rest of that connective tissue was at, okay? And so then these guys, or what becomes those flat irons. If I can go through here, just finish taking that connective tissue off. These are tricky to get with a smaller animal. And so um, do what you can. You can you know, experiment on them. Deer, antelope, they're wonderful experiments. But these will be easier to get on your bigger elk, moose, Bison, anything big. It runs the entire length of this muscle. Um, oh, in terms of right here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And especially the closer to um, where, where I separated it off here at, the, at that uh, humerus scapula joint, it's really, really wide up there, and then it just kind of fans out the further down it goes. and gets thinner, um, and so definitely starting at the top where it's really thick and then following it down will help you stay on that tendon. And as you're experimenting with these, um, 
it's OK if you, if you, you know, accidentally dive a little bit too deep. This bottom part of that flat iron occasionally becomes sacrificial. Um, and so try to salvage as much as you can on the top here. Uh, and then if you happen to dive too far down, that's OK. That's why I use the cheat method, um, where I just take a little slice off of the side, and that exposes the entire tendon. So then you can go as slow as you want, making sure that you don't accidentally dip below it. And then you can have the two different pieces. And so then with these flat irons, if you want, you can leave them whole like this. Um, you can choose to go through and divide up into, in the industry, we divide them up into thirds. And so you get smaller portion steaks. Um, you can cut them in half. You can cut them however you want. We'll cut, uh, we'll cut these guys in half for you. So then you've got, there we go. So you have two packs. So then there you go. So then those are the flat irons. OK? All right flat irons and then the last thing we can do here just to kind of minimize any trim would be to work up the shanks so the shanks refer to any of the legs the front leg the back leg it's all shank um, what I like to do would be to make you can make also buco which is truly it just means on the bone or off the bone and so if you have a handsaw at home or a bandsaw I'm gonna try to keep that off the table because it's dirty um, you can truly go through here and make cross cuts out of this and leave that bone connected that's just fine um, if you don't have a handsaw or you're like me I ordered one off of Amazon and it arrived I'm like this is flimsy it's not gonna work and I sent it back um, you can still do fun stuff with shanks fun with shanks um, has anybody ever had a lamb shank at a restaurant? Anybody? Lamb shanks are delicious. Beef shanks are delicious. Again, copper. I went to copper, and they had a, a pork shank there. Shanks can be really, really good, and it saves you the hassle of having to go through. What are we doing on time? I don't think we are. OK. It saves you the hassle of having to go through and separate all these little itty bitty tendons to make grind out of. Crock-pots, Instapots make quick work of the tendons that are in these shanks. And so um, you, you can certainly leave it whole. What I would recommend was go through and make like little like shank medallion type of things. And then again, you put these in your crock pot, you can slow braise them. That connective tissue will break down and it'll peel off the bone and it'll be really, really nice. Okay. Or if you're looking for more grind, by all means, you can go through here and you can take all of those tendons apart. You can separate the lean. But this gives you an, another cut that you can put in the crock pot. It's the exact same as Osobuco. It is just doesn't have the bone connected to it. So to recap here, so we've got that Vegas strip steak that comes off the underside of that scapula, the Terrace Major. This was the mock tender, leave it whole or cut medallions if you take that tendon out of it. Okay. Um, any flat piece of meat that you find can be turned into jerky strips. This guy up here was our triceps that we turned into our ranch steaks. This guy would also become jerky later. That is his destiny. And then you've got your flat irons followed by your shank cuts. Okay. All right. So out of our hindquarter here, we'll definitely get a shank. Yes. But then we get the top round, the bottom round, the eye around, the knuckle, and the heel. Okay, and so these muscles—they're all going to peel apart really, really nice. Um, yeah, I'm just going to throw them all over the place. But there are four different that we can get apart from this one hindquarter. Um, and if you all want to come up later, and I can show you um, where they sit a little bit more in detail, I certainly can do that. Okay, stay. All righty, so. The one muscle that nobody mentioned earlier in our, you know, tell me what muscles you want to find, um, is the tri-tip. Does anybody like tri-tip? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, being from Ohio, nobody back home knows what the tri-tip is. It is definitely a Western cut of meat. Um, and this is one that you can find on your wild game. So if you identify that, all right, so here is the top round, also known as the inside round. So it is sitting here on the table. It is on top. So that is the top round. Okay. The bottom round is sitting on the bottom. Is the bottom. It's also called the outside. So top round, bottom round. The eye of round, 
will sit right here. Okay, that is going to be the hamstring, so it sits on the um, the back of the animal's leg here. So that's the hamstring, and then the knuckle. The knuckle is the quadricep. So as this animal is walking, the quadricep sits right here, and the tri-tip tucks right in that little flank area. And so you have to be careful when you um, take apart the hindquarters here that you don't accidentally cut the tri-tip. And so Jake did a really good job of keeping that intact. And so if the quad is right here, the tricep is the little itty bitty muscle that's sitting off to the side of it. And it's going to look fairly triangular. So I'm gonna peel off this tri-tip. There we go. Come back. Alrighty. So this tri-tip, or I guess in game, it's going to be very, very easy to accidentally cut off some of the tips. So this one, it's going to be a two-tip, and that's okay. Um, the other tri-tip would sit a little bit closer to the rest of our sirloin as it dives a little bit more into the loin. And so it truly just sits in this area. But with game, it is tricky. You know, wanting to make sure that, you know, we're hitting the right joints and it's really easy for us to, to get home. Um, we're not really thinking about muscles at that point. So the fact that we got any of this tri-tip is really terrific. And so again, that muscle just sits right here on the outside of the quadricep. Okay, so just find this really big bulging muscle and anything that's sitting off on the side of it is your tri-tip. Alrighty. And so this guy then, yeah, it's pretty lean anyway, um, but you can... Trim it up just a little bit, and then always smoke your tri-tips. Don't put these in crock pots. I think people, again, I'm from Ohio originally, so we didn't know how to cook tri-tip. It wasn't in our DNA, um, so we've had to learn. And if you mention crock potting them. How come, how come you wouldn't crock pot them? It is a really tender muscle, and it's really flavorful. It's just a waste. Yeah. You can put, you can put anything in a, I mean, you can put a tenderloin in a, if you really want, I mean, you'd have meat, meat mush. Um, but it's just one of those muscles, it's like, why? It's delightful no matter what you do, that you just, you don't need to crock pot it because it's, it's really flavorful. It's, it's part of the bottom sirloin subprimal. And so it's tender like a sirloin, and it's got the, the beefy, lean flavor like a sirloin. And so you just, and it's, it's fairly tender too. So you just don't need it to be crock potted. Um, so the knuckle is again the quadricep. So big, round, bulbous muscle that's going to make up a, a really big bulk of that hindquarter here. And so it's going to be very easy to just follow seams on this hindquarter and just start rolling muscles apart. Okay, so very similar to what we did with with that triceps on the, on the front of the carcass, just find seams and peel them apart. I think this is probably the portion of the carcass that folks feel most comfortable with because the seams are really obvious. They're just big and they're just begging. It's like, hey, cut here. And then once we get them apart, that's where we get a little confused of, okay, I just pulled apart this big muscle. I don't know what it is, but it looks like it could be something. All right, so finding this quadricep, again, the big round one, it's going to want to roll out, let it, let it do its thing. All right. Just finding this bone, just gonna keep rolling. There we go. And we'll just separate it right off there, okay. So there's our quadricep. Because this piece is connected to the sirloin, they think, oh, it's part of the sirloin. It's the sirloin tip. Again, where meat science has really got it wrong and made it super confusing. So um, in a restaurant, you might call or see like a sirloin tip steak, a sirloin tip roast, something along those lines. That's the knuckle, OK? So your knuckle's right here. Um, and I will show you either how to cut steaks or roast out of that guy in a bit. We're just going to take apart all of our big pieces. So knuckle is the quadricep here. The top round or the inside round sits on the inside of the leg. Top round, inside round, so it's still here on top, right? So all I'm going to do, there's this big 
Again, another seam. It's just begging to be cut, so I'm going to cut this big seam. Does anybody like skirt steaks, flank steaks, thin cuts of meat? Lovely. So this top round has a cap on it. Okay, and You can call it the top round cap. Scientific name is the gracilis. But anyway, so this muscle, it, it just looks very, very obvious that it's the next thing that you want to peel off. And once you do, this whole thing starts to come apart. And it's like terrific. So we're taking off the entire top round right now. And it has this cap on it that can act like a skirt steak, like a flank steak. It's going to be really, really thin. And then you can marinate it. You can slice it. You can grill it. You can do all those same wonderful things that you would with a flank or a skirt. Okay. All right. And that is on the top round, which sits on top. Okay. All right, so there's that guy, top round. Beautiful. Okay. Then the last thing here that is remaining is then the bottom round that sits on the bottom. Um, and so all I have to do is trace around this bone, and it's going to pop right up. use this knife because I don't like it as much. Every time you hit a bone, you should steal your knife. Every time you hit the table, um, again, just realigning those teeth and making sure that they are straight. Um, because the longer that you cut with a knife like this, the more likely that you're going to roll those edges. So have your, your kitchen steel readily available. Don't be afraid to use it. All righty. So here, I'm also separating off what's called the heel, because top round, bottom round, eye round, knuckle, heel. So we're taking off all of this. And in the heel, which is where the calf muscle, it's, it's equivalent to our calf muscles, there's actually a really tender steak in there too. And so we'll show a little, little hack there as well. Okay, so again, we're just finding big seams and we're separating them out. There we go. Okay, set him up. All righty. We go. All right, so I'm just going to start just kind of taking off some of these extra little muscles here, just cleaning some stuff up. And then we're going to go back and start cutting steaks and roasts. The hind quarter is where you're going to get a lot of really good roasts from. Um, the front portion of your animals are good for steaks because um, there's a lot of extra muscles that are wrapped around fat. There's a lot of fat that runs through, um, through the front of the animal. And in the back, um, there just aren't those big pieces of seams. So the muscles are much bigger, the muscles are much leaner, and so that kind of um, lends them to be more so, more so for your roasts. Okay. There we go. There's our heel. There we go. Beautiful. So again, just separating out all these muscles. So here is our top round. It's kind of shaped like a heart here. And that is the one that sat on the inside of the leg. So the top round, the bottom round, the eye round here. It's kind of small in this guy. The eye round, again, is the hamstring that sits on the back. And then the knuckle. And then this portion is the heel. So the best cut to get steaks out of would be this knuckle, okay? You can go through and you can cut big roasts and that is just fine. You can cut London broils because London broil just means big lean cut of meat. Um, but I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna turn this guy into sirloin tip steaks. The quadricep, how many muscles do we think it contains? Four, because it's quad, yes. So there are four. So this guy that's kind of sitting here 
hanging out. Just kind of a trash one. So we're going to cut that one off. And that'll be grind. Thank you, Sitka, for the bowl. And then I can kind of just make a little dissection cut here. And this fourth muscle is very, very small. It sits here right in the middle. And it's just going to be a sacrificial muscle for us. Okay, So that guy just kind of sat there in the middle. We're just going to peel him off. All righty. And now the rest of this quadricep, we can start just opening it up. And we're really interested in the muscles that are sitting on the inside here. All righty. So we might be able to start seeing where there's a big one off to the side here, and then there's a smaller one here. And so I'm going to kind of work my way, trim away any fat that might be sitting there, and kind of find that seam that separates this bigger muscle, the bigger one, from the smaller one that's off to the side. So find that seam and start peeling them apart. The best thing about game is that there's not a lot of fat on them. These animals are, you know, out, they're running around. And so even these seams want to naturally peel apart in a way that beef doesn't necessarily just because there's a lot of seam fat on beef. And so you'll be able to peel these, these seams apart. Okay. Here we go. Just working this seam apart. And these will become sirloin tip steaks. And this cut is going to be very, very similar to um, really, really everything that we did out of the chuck, where if you find a seam of connective tissue when you're cutting steaks, don't leave that seam there and just say, ah, it'll cook out. It won't. <laughs> okay, that seam of connective tissue is made to be very, very heat stable because as these animals are out roaming around on the plains, climbing mountains, these seams of connective tissue are there so that as friction rubs against those muscles, these muscle tissues don't break down. And so if you cut a steak and you leave that connective tissue in it, high heat, such as your grill, such as your cast iron, will not break it down the way low, slow crock pots will. Okay. And so I've just taken this entire big muscle, just rolled it apart, and then I have this larger section then this little guy that's flatter off to the side. I'm just going to separate out some of this connective tissue. We'll turn that into ground beef later. OK. And there I have two muscles that can now be cut into steaks. This, uh, this shorter, flatter one is ready to go. There is no connective tissue that runs through it. And so I can go through right now, take my knife, find which direction the seams are running, and flip it sideways. I'm just going to square it up. And now I can go through right now and cut steaks. I'm going to cut them half an inch thick just because it's a longer steak. And those are ready to go. You can absolutely cut these steaks out of your smaller animals, your antelope, your deer. Because it's such a big muscle, those steaks, I mean, they'll be a little bit smaller, but you can get a bunch out of them. Okay, so there's one side of those sirloin tip steaks. Lay it up here with our tri-tip or two-tip. On this bigger portion, it looks like it's ready to go, right? That it's, you know, it's ready just to be chunked up and they're going to be nice little fillets. What I'm going to find, though, is that there is... Da -da 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 -da. There is this seam, and as I square it up here, it reveals another seam that's on the inside here. Okay, I think you guys can see that. So there is a big seam of connective tissue that runs all the way across this steak. So if you so desire, you can cut this uh, sirloin tip into steaks, but keep in mind they're going to be fairly tough because of that connective tissue. And so. I would recommend cutting those super duper thin. Jake said that he didn't mind having some roasts, and so that whole thing I'm going to leave as a roast. Um, fits really, really nice in the crock pot. It's about mm, two and a half, three pounds, depending on the size of your elk. 
feeds your family, and then I don't have to necessarily worry about that big seam of connective tissue. If you pull this out of the package later and decide, Ugh, I'm really sick of roasts, I'd like to have more steaks, you didn't cut it, so you can still turn this into steaks later on. You can still thaw this piece of meat out and then cut steaks and you know, decide to grill them. Um, so that's, that's the beauty of, of this cut. So Jake, if you don't like what I'm doing, you can absolutely take this home and you can transform this guy into steaks. Very similar to what I did with that mock tender though, I would recommend taking this muscle, finding that seam, and then trying to cut it out so that then you have a, a more tender steak here. Cut them really thin. Um, so you can have steaks, they would be smaller, but again, then you're just gonna have more that goes into grind. That's a choice that's left up to you though. Next, we're gonna do this top round, as promised. All right, so with this top round, so here's this gracilis muscle. We wanna peel off of here. And this is the one that then we can use just like a flank steak or a skirt steak. <laughs> All right, voila, there it is. So this is the top round cap. It's a very, very thin piece of meat, but it's very easy to see where the striations are at or how those muscle fibers run. And so it makes it a really good cut. You can marinate it and then you're gonna just slice it across those grain just like you would any other fajita piece of meat like a skirt or a flank. Um, quite truthfully, don't even bother coming through here and getting super duper picky with this, this silver skin over here. That's what kind of holds that whole muscle together. And so that is ready to go um, as a top round cap steak, marinate it, slice it. It's very nice. Okay, the rest of this top round is where you can get a lot of jerky out of. You can get London broils, you can get top round steaks. There's this muscle that's off here to the side. Um, fun piece of meat science knowledge. Um, this muscle, it discolors the fastest out of all of the muscles in the hindquarter or anywhere else in the carcass. Um, and so don't get super discouraged if you see discoloration on the face of this. Doesn't mean it's bad, it just happens to get discolored the fastest. So um, you can certainly cut that off if it grosses you out, um, but there's, there's really nothing wrong with it. Okay, there is a muscle that's off to the side here. So in the whole top round here, it kind of wants to fall apart with this seam. You can cut big, um, like inch and a half London broils out of here, which I will. But what I'm gonna do first is take off this side muscle. This is the adductor. So abduction means to take away, adductor. This one is what brings the leg in. So it does do a lot of work. It is a muscle that you don't wanna cut super thick steaks out of. But again, Texans love to make money. And so they called this the San Antonio steak. And so you can peel off all these other little muscles. And if you're looking for more steaks out of your critter, this San Antonio steak is a good one. But again, it does a lot of work. And so cut them fairly thin. I'm gonna cut off just, uh, we'll square up the front here. That's just not very pretty. And then we can cut half inch San Antonio steaks. And this is just the little side muscle that sat here on this top round. Okay, and those make nice little San Antonio medallion steaks. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay. Shank. All right. The rest of this top round here, you can choose to cut your London broils. All right. I'm just going to face that, make it squared up. So, London broil, I would say, would be like an mm, inch and a half or so. And then those you could marinate. Um, you could take your time and um, you know, flatten them out if you want to. You can smoke them. You can roast them. You can do whatever you want. Um, so those would be more of an inch, inch and a half kind of a style. Or you can cut thinner steaks, half inch, quarter inch, top round steaks. Do a four pack of top round steaks. And then we'll wrap the last one up here with another London bro to make a two pack. All right. 
There we go. There's London broils or your top round steaks. So moving then into the bottom round is also a big lean piece of meat. There's this really obvious piece of connective tissue here. We're going to want to remove that. Out of the bottom round and the top round, either of these make really, really good pieces of jerky. So I'm going to take, I'll take this guy here. So I went through and this was one of those slices that I took just kind of right out of the middle. I can then flip this on its side. We'll go this way. Remove that skin. And then this is where I can get more slices of jerky. So it was a slice taken out like this. I lay it on its side. And then this is where I can go through and shave jerky slices out of. Kind of cut them out of an angle. And then you can just go down through there and make as much jerky as you want. Okay? So top round's good for jerky. Bottom round's good for jerky. The ribeye, if you really want to tick off your friends and family, can be jerky. <laughs> Okay, so now with this bottom round, I took off that silver skin. So you can kind of tell that there is a thicker side and a thinner side. On the thicker side, this was more anterior to the animal. It was closer up to the head, and it was closer to the sirloin. So if you have a big bottom round, this one's a little bit smaller, you can take your hand, and on the thicker portion, lay it on top of there, and about the thickness of your hand makes a really nice roast. That is called the rump roast. So I'll do that for Jake here. About the thickness of your hand. And that's called the rump roast because it's what connects in with the sirloin. Okay? This whole muscle here becomes tougher from the front of the animal. or it's, It gets tougher from the front towards the back. So the thicker portion was closer to the head. That's the portion that makes a really nice roast and it shreds apart really good. It's called the rump roast. The rest of this then you can cut into steaks, you can cut into jerky, whatever you so decide. There's a seam here, I'm just gonna peel that guy off. And then you can go through and cut steaks, you can do jerky, whatever you'd like. Mm -hmm. Eye of round. Remember when I told you the mock tender was my second least favorite muscle? The eye of round is my least favorite, okay? Because it likes to trick everybody. It looks like it's a really nice roast. It looks like it's gonna be a really nice steak. Um, the face here isn't super pretty, so I can show you how beautiful of a steak it makes. Um, they look like they're gonna be really, really tender, okay? What's wrong with the eye of round is, again, this is the hamstring, okay? The eye of round has a lot of connective tissue in it. It has elastin. Elastin is the toughest protein, toughest connective tissue in the entire body. If you've ever heard of anybody tearing their ACL, you can actually take a portion of your hamstring to repair your ACL. It is that tough of a muscle because of that elastin, which makes this muscle really, really deceptive. Eye of round steaks are not good steaks. Unless you cut them super thin, unless you marinate them, unless you pound them with a mallet, they can be really, really tough and really deceptive. Um, I've had great eye round steaks with a smaller animal. So with antelope, with, um, with a whitetail, with a mule deer, eye round steaks can be really good. But you have to be really careful and cut them thin. I would recommend your eye round remain as a roast. If there were any muscle in the entire carcass to keep as a roast, make it the eye round. Um, likewise, this muscle has really, really um, tight bundles of muscles within it. You can see where all the muscle fibers are at, um, which means that when you actually cook this, it's going to shred apart and those muscle fibers are going to remain really, really long. That makes this muscle great for barbecue. And so if you put it in your crock pot, your Instapot, whatever it might be, you put barbecue sauce with it, this makes a really good shredding muscle. Okay, so eye round like you to keep it as a roast if you can. Final countdown, I'm going to show you the Merlot steak, okay? This is our last muscle that we'll talk about today. Um, actually, I will whip through the ribeye really quick though. Um, this comes out of, again, the calf. So this whole muscle kind of sat right here. It's where your calf would be at. The way to actually turn this into a nice steak is remove this big piece of tendinous muscle that's right through the middle here. This is called the banana shank. We sell a lot of these in the beef industry um, to markets overseas. 
a lot of Taiwanese folks like these because they do a lot of slow cooking style meals. And this little group of mussels has a lot of tendons in it. Um, I actually kept the banana shank out of the elk that we got this year. I'm going to experiment with it, but it is really tough. Um, it, it has pretty much all of the connective tissue that your calf really contains. So the banana shank itself, remove that, and then you're left with kind of just the shell of these mussels that are really, really tender. And this becomes the Merlot steak. Yes, Merlot, just like the wine. And so there are two different parts of it. You can kind of just find, separate them into two different steaks. This flatter one is the better Merlot. Um, this other one, it's kind of got like a ridge to it. You can separate that off and you can still get a Merlot steak out of it. But this flatter portion is a little bit more tender and it grows a little bit more evenly. So just take off that connective tissue. This was a cut I discovered when I was in Wyoming. Um, I'd never heard of it before. And we went into a shop and I was like, what's the Merlot steak? They're like, oh, it, it comes out of the shank. And I was like, well, that can't be right. And I was like, how do you cook it? Like, you, you, I mean, you grill it. And I was like, that really can't be right. And so I started playing around with them and it is true. As long as you take out the banana shank, which contains all of the connective tissue, the remaining portion is very, very tender and able to be grilled really nicely. This last shank as well, I'll probably finish working that up later. Shanks, again, really great for osobuco, which means on the bone. Um, so you can come through with a handsaw and cut little cross sections out of here if you so choose, or you can go through and bone this out and still make nice little round portions of, of shank. Braise that for a long time, keep it in liquid, and all of that connective tissue breaks down. The connective tissue here in the shanks breaks down much easier than what like the flat iron does. That connective tissue again is the strongest in the whole animal. So it doesn't break down well. So the ribeyes are what you all in the game world call the back strap. Yeah? Alrighty. I like to call them the ribeye. Okay, so back straps truly are the ribeyes of the animal and the fillets are the tenderloin. So the ribeye and the tenderloins are all these middle meats that come out of the middle of the carcass. And these are pretty much the only, sorry guys, these are pretty much the only meats that you all will be able to salvage from the middle of the carcass because the rest of our, our rib cuts, um, they're all pretty much gonna be pretty, pretty thin on, on wild game. And so if you can imagine here, this is what our, our critter looks like. Those ribeyes and those back straps, we're gonna come through here and be able to remove that entire inner loin, that back strap, and that becomes your ribeye, okay? And so where you can see that there are some muscles that start to kind of fall apart here, these are from the front of the animal, okay? There are several muscles up here that all kind of converge together, and then the main loin muscle just kind of takes over and becomes more prominent. This main loin muscle, it's called the longissimus dorsi here, and it is smaller from the front, and then it gets bigger towards the back. So this back section here is where you're gonna get really, really nice ribeye steaks from. So you can come through here, and you can just go down through and cut your ribeye steaks, however thick you want them. Down towards this direction then, where all of those muscles you know, kind of converge, what I might choose to do is do kind of like what a prime rib roast would be. You can cut a you know, three, four inch section out of that guy. Because these muscles, if I were to cut a steak out of that, all four of these muscles are just gonna keep falling apart. And then that main loin muscle, again, really wants to take control and become bigger as it goes back towards that animal. So cutting a section that's you know, four inches, five inches thick, kind of like the width of your hand, and using that as a prime rib roast is really, really nice. You, you can wrap that in bacon if you want, anything you'd like. Okay, the section then that is right next to where you take that prime rib roast out, this is still a ribeye. It's a very traditional looking ribeye. This circular looking muscle off of, 
off of the, even the flies want it, off of the side of that main loin muscle, it's called the spinalis. I will fight anybody for the spinalis. This is my favorite muscle in the entire carcass. So if you have a game animal that is really, really lean and all of these muscles kind of want to unwind, they don't want to stay together, and this cap falls off, that is called the ribeye cap. It will be really, really thin. I like it when it's still, you know, connected and can give you a nice ribeye looking steak. But if your critter doesn't want to stay together, it's very lean and this muscle comes off, do not put that in your grind. That is the ribeye cap. It's really, really tender. My favorite muscle in the whole carcass. Um, and you'd be able to, um, to grill that and it'd be really great. Okay. Um, you are welcome to with like a smaller animal. Um, if you have like an abundance of meat and you're tired of ribeyes, which who's you know ever really tired of ribeyes, but if you wanna get creative, you could go down through here and you could fillet the top of this guy wide open and then roll that out and then make a stuffed you know, elk loin or a stuffed deer loin, whatever you might want to do. Um, this would be the muscle to do that with, and they're really good. If you want to impress your family at home, you had 18 tags to fill. Again, you could even, you know, cut ribeye steaks out of this half. Um, actually, ribeye steaks out of this half, save that spinalis, and then go down to here towards the end where these steaks are just one whole muscle. And then that's where you could then, you know, fillet the top, roll it out, stuff it with things, roll it back together and roast it. So there's a lot that you can do with this entire um, loin section here. Um, but the front portion here, again, where that spinalis muscle are and all these other little unique muscles, those would be considered your ribeye steaks. And then as we keep coming back here, where that main loin muscle takes over, those would be considered your, your New York strip steaks. The exact same muscle, but it just becomes something different when it's called the loin. And then our actual tenderloin here, this muscle comes out of the inside of the carcass. Do not let your friends leave this behind, okay? Um, I've heard some folks where um, they go out hunting and maybe, maybe you're in like a really bear heavy area. Um, you don't wanna take the time to gut your animals or you're just concerned about weather, whatever it might be. Um, people take the ribeyes and they, they boogie out of there. It is worth it to make sure you go through, you gut that animal, and you take that tenderloin out. I'm gonna have to flip this around. So the tenderloin, you do have to dive into the carcass to find it, and it's gonna be sitting. So here's the rib cage. It will sit further back, and then you have to actually come up underneath that spinal column and find that tenderloin. Okay, so you do have to gut the animal to get it, and the tenderloin sits in, on the inside, um, and this is also a muscle that discolors very quickly. It's very, very tender. It is the most tender in the whole carcass, um, but it can take on some funky flavors as well. So because this is the muscle that, you know, you have to gut the animal first and then people go through and they actually, you know, take the hide off, they quarter it. But this is the muscle that you have to get to first and you throw this at the bottom of your bag. It's really, really tender, so you're probably gonna smush it. And it might then absorb all the weird gross smells and tastes from everything else that you just threw on top of it. So protect the tenderloin. Um, it is a, a very small, delicate muscle, um, but friends don't let friends leave the tenderloin behind. Thank you all so much. If you have questions, let's chat. Um, otherwise, have a great Wednesday.